Hello. Hi. Whoa. That's that's happening, Zach. Okay, cool. Wow. What an exciting room. Hello and welcome to the Kelly Writer's House. For how many of you is this your first time in the new Arts Cafe? All right. Very nice. Yeah, can we can do that. Can we clap for the new Arts Cafe? Thank you. What a beautiful new arts cafe. We've been waiting a long time, and some of us have been waiting an even longer time. And now it's here, and we're in it, and it's still a work in progress very beautifully. Uh, thank you so much for being in this beautiful new space with me. I'm Davy Niddle. You are at City Planning Poetic 6, Urban Revitalization. Something I like to ask at these events is for folks in the room, and if you identify both of these ways, that's totally fine. Uh, Urbanist-oriented folks, design folks, architecture folks. We got a few. Awesome. Uh, poetry folks. This is a poetry audience. <laughs> awesome. Cool. I'm so, so excited to have Douglas Kearney and Brian Goldstein here in the Arts Cafe. We've been planning this event for over a year. And I was thinking back on the five previous City Planning Poetics events, and I think this is the first one of two folks uh, whose work I've taught and whose work I really love teaching. It's some of my very favorite work to teach. And so that's a real pleasure and an honor to share this room with you. Uh, I also want to thank some folks before I give an introduction to Doug and Brian's work. Thank you to Jessica Lowenthal, who does so much work to make so many things happen at the Writer's House and especially does a lot of work for this series, including securing Creative Ventures funding, which enables me to bring these folks and for us to be in this room together. Thank you to Ali. Thank you to Zach. Thank you, Al. And uh, thank you all of you for being here. Thank you, everyone, doing the work to prepare the reception tonight. The structure is this. I'm going to introduce their work. They're each going to talk for 15 to 20 minutes. And then we're going to open it up to a Q&A. Think as the program is happening about questions you'd be excited to ask both of them or one of them. That sets them in dialogue. This is a really lovely chance to have two folks who come from very different disciplinary and formal fields together thinking about questions that matter to both of them. And then I hope you stick around and join us for a wonderful reception in the dining room. Cool. Douglas Kearney's most recent collection, Buck Studies, is composed of six serial poems and six shorter works. The penultimate serial poem, No Wake, Too Much of Fucking Everything, in Kearney's words, documents time spent in 2014 at the Rauschenberg Residency on Captiva Island, Florida. On the poem's opening page, blocks of text, alternately bold and Roman, small caps and lowercase, turn at angles from one another to reproduce the island's tangle of privatized development and nominally accessible beaches, flora, and roads. No trespassing is produced in all caps above the text of the poem four times. Beneath and beside it, fragments read, quote, the houses and boats have names here, and in the cinder block compost bunker, tomorrow molders, vermin aren't mean, but hungry. Kearney's portrait of Captiva is composed of fish getting, the names of lizards, visitor maps to previously private buildings, the list of toppings on the man overboard pizza, and count countless signs encouraging their reader not to trespass, loiter, travel down a private road, or touch or get on someone's boat. Kearney composes in the poem an overabundance that at once critiques and echoes the too much of the fucking everything of overdeveloped tourist attractions designed to offer access to the same ecologies their presence displaces in what Kearney describes as the odd American city along green waters. The, poems in books, the poem in book studies that follows No Wake Too Much of Fucking Everything is head note to a Dunn poem dedicated to former unofficial Los Angeles poet laureate Wanda Coleman. The poem reads as a series of interlocking and interrupted letters to the city of Los Angeles, and its subsets in highways, districts, people alone and in groups, aesthetics, affects, and material culture. Dear LA, it opens, and then spins out into other dedications. Dear throat of grout, throat of fruit, dear amnesiac eardrums, dear armless palm trees, the final three stanzas read. Dear children of the, of the, my great regret for reckoning you wouldn't want, all what's left below folding chairs and garage rotting boxes and by the final curb, her words where her picture would be, her picture where her words. Dear what's left of us, I regret we didn't know. A mind like a heart was no mark-ass simile. Dear family, dear Austin, dear I. Uh, 
Kearney's work accounts for the cycles of quotidian damage of being black in the present and the past in the US. There's a relationship between remains in the poems, a catalog of garage rotting boxes of the final curve of the what's left, and the way the poems return to, linger with, and cycle through language. They're different poems on the page than in the air, and different on each reading for the adventure you choose each time you mark your way through them. In all cases, they single words out, they pick them up, they make words loud or weird. They demand that the representation of anti-black violence be specific but also to scale. And they draw out the language of urban decay and revitalization as the physical landscape whose design and redesign stage and ratify that violence. In the acknowledgments at the close of Buck Studies, Kearney includes in a list of dedications to poets, family, and friends, a dedication, quote, to the activists who work in hopes of keeping the execution of black people in the streets from turning into white noise. Kearney's engagement with cities is sometimes in the background, sometimes right at the surface, but across his incredible corpus, beginning with the 2006 collection Fearsome, his work has a lot to say about cities, about urban change, about who and what in cities gets revitalized, and about the dreams and the dangers of that revitalization. The Oxford English Dictionary defines definition of revitalize is to restore to vitality, to put new life or vigor into. Vigor in the OED is defined as active physical strength, as an attribute or quality of living things, active force or power, activity or energy of body or constitution. When you revitalize a city, you help it get its strength back. Revitalization, therefore, makes an argument about what has made and makes a city strong. To revitalize is also to pretend or use your language to believe that cities are bodies, that they're alive. Revitalization has that in common with other words to describe things that happen to cities. Blight, like cities are plants with a fungus, or decay, like cities are teeth. To revitalize is to return a city to itself, to recognize a gap between strength and strength. Kearney's poems attend to the bodies and spaces and affects, the anger, the excess, the too much that takes up residence in those gaps. His poems trouble the line between improvement and restoration. Urban justice is unavailable within a process of returning in a country founded on coerced black labor, in cities built and therefore always existing in slavery's wake. The restoration involved in revitalizing often, maybe usually, enacts violence, even as the discourse of revitalization also offers hope. It's the hinge between hope and violence that urban and architectural historian Brian Goldstein explores in his 2017 book, The Roots of Urban Renaissance, Gentrification and the Struggle Over Harlem. In the book, Goldstein describes the relationship between community-led revitalization projects and corporate privatization in Harlem from the end of urban renewal in the 1960s to the present. He argues that post-renewal Harlem activists saw revitalization as a means by which they could seize control of both property and planning, and with it locally counteract the effects of New York City's decline in the 1960s and 1970s. Goldstein seeks to complicate narratives of neighborhood change in Harlem that identify corporate development interests as the sole or even primary engine of gentrification. He argues instead that community control efforts that sought to improve the neighborhood in the final decades of the 20th century had the unintended effects of making Harlem appealing to outside developers. By telling this narrative at the scale of community organizing and neighborhood activism, he raises questions at the heart of all, the work toward urban, of all work toward urban justice. Whose vision for the future of the city should shape how urban neighborhoods change? How can urban residents advocate for their rights to the accessibility of basic resources while they resist producing improvements that enable privatization? Where is the line between revitalization and gentrification? Goldstein's writing, like Kearney's, also argues that the language we use to describe urban change is integral to what is both possible and inevitable in city neighborhoods. Goldstein's work asks, how can we most effectively describe the ways revitalization is always raced, classed, and scaled? What role do our descriptions play in how we perceive urban change and what we might do to shape it? Among these considerations, Goldstein frames the book as a history of community organizing and activism in Harlem that troubles the language used in the political and cultural life of cities to describe urban change. In the book's introduction, he writes, tracing the history of the organizations and individuals who produce the transformation of black neighborhoods concretizes a process of change that is often described only in amorphous terms, such as revival, revitalization, and renaissance that fail to capture the social processes, individual decisions, and political dynamics that shaped Harlem at the community level. Gentrification itself remains a term wielded for diverse ideological purposes, imprecise in its exact meaning, and at risk of obscuring more than it reveals. Yet it remains the prominent word used to describe the demographics and physical changes that swept across neighborhoods like Harlem in these decades and that continue into the present day.
these are my favorite like six sentences for having conversations about gentrification with students. They've been so helpful. Revitalization, Goldstein argues, is a term with no inherently clear meaning. Doing the work of revitalization requires producing language more specific and contextual than the term itself. Goldstein and Kearney are both skeptical about the way privatized places produce narratives of localized self-improvement and, co and often co-opt the lexicon of access and justice employed by community-led initiatives. As Goldstein explains the broader stakes of his project in the book's conclusion, community development, which had once stood for a racial, communitarian, and collectivist ideal of the future city, instead came to represent an image of Harlem as a place whose revitalization would proceed from its entrance into a so-called economic mainstream. This view predominated by the end of the 20th century as public-private development partnerships and income diversification became the watchwords of community development, not only in Harlem, but nationwide. A primary wager of both Kearney and Goldstein's work is that the language available to us to shape future places depends on where we turn our focus when we narrate the past. How do we talk about the social and affective consequences of infrastructural change? How can we keep a record of the way cities feel and of the conversations, poems, music, and writing that help us use words to represent those feelings? How do those feelings matter exactly to what happens in and to the built environment? Read together, Kearney and Goldstein's work reminds us that revitalization can not only refer to the built environment of cities, but always also refers to urban, political, social, cultural, and private life. How we feel and how we talk to each other has everything to do with what it's like to walk around in our neighborhoods and how different it is for each of us and what we think it might be like in a year or five or 15. Setting those cultural materials, social and political registers in dialogue is a project for which we need both poems and history and the blur between them. As Goldstein's lexically attentive critical prose reminds us, the efficacy of academic language often depends upon a precision inseparable from its music. As Kearney's work under underscores, what many poems offer is a reframing of the language of socio-historical events from which they differ from critical accounts, not in their rigor, but in their form. Brian Goldstein is an architectural and urban historian and an assistant professor of architectural history at Swarthmore College. His research focuses on the intersection of the built environment, race and class, and social movements, especially in the United States. His writing includes the 2017 book, The Roots of Urban Renaissance, Gentrification and the Struggle Over Harlem, and articles appearing in the Journal of American History, Journal of Urban History, and the edited volumes, Reassessing Rudolph, Affordable Housing in New York, and Summer in the City, John Lindsay, New York and the American Dream. He is the recipient of fellowships and awards from the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts, Society of Architectural Historians, Society for American City and Regional Planning History, Center for the Humanities at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History. Goldstein received his PhD from Harvard University and has taught previously at the University of New Mexico and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Douglas Kearney has published six books, most recently Buck Studies, Fence Books 2016, winner of the Theater Retke Memorial Poetry Prize and the CLMP Firecracker Award for Poetry and Silver Medalist for the California Book Award. Kearney's collection of writing on poetics and performativity, Mess and Mess and, Noemi Press 2015, was a small press distribution hand-picked selection the Publishers Weekly called an extraordinary book. His work has been exhibited at the American Jazz Museum, Temple Contemporary, Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions, and the Visitors Welcome Center Los Angeles. Raised in Altadena, California, he lives with his family west of Minneapolis and teaches at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. It is my tremendous pleasure to welcome them both to the Kelly Writers House. Thank you. Um, thank you, Davey, for inviting uh, me and for putting me in conversation with um, Doug. It's a very big honor. Um, and also for that very generous introduction. Um, and thank you, all of you, for being here. And I uh, am only slightly intimidated by an audience of poets. Um, <laughs> I've been told by historians that I write fairly well, but I feel like that's on a slightly different scale. So, um, you know, I'm among bad writers. I'm an OK writer. So. Um, <laughs> So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk kind of broadly about my work for um, 15, 20 minutes or so, um, and then turn over the mic to Doug. So um, I've developed a habit when I write. Uh, when I'm talking about intentional change in urban places, there's always a point where I need a noun describing what I'm talking about. Revitalization, I think. And then I hit the brakes. Or maybe revival or renewal. Yet none of these seem quite right. These terms, like many, used to describe changing neighborhoods embody value judgments. 
Um, we hear that a neighborhood is coming back or turning around or going downhill or getting better or getting worse. Once one begins to reflect on the implications of each, writing urban history quickly becomes paralyzing. Coming back from what? Going downhill to what? Embedded in those metaphors are assumptions about race and class, power and taste. One person's better is another person's worse. One person's vitality is another person's displacement. I often settle on transformation, but this creates its own problems. First, its best quality, the neutrality contained in the simple fact of change, is also its biggest liability. No change is neutral, and point of view, uh, even for an academic historian, is always present. Pretend non-judgment is certainly worse than judgment, at least in my field, and Edge is dangerously close to pretending that scholarly objectivity is possible at all. Second, technically speaking, transformation is the kind of big word that you can't use too many times without be it becoming awkward. I can't tell you how many hours, you know, between 1 and 4 a.m. I've spent trying to get rid of four transformations in the same paragraph. <laughs> so I find myself looking for synonyms, and inevitably I find myself back to revitalization. I reflected on the meaning of this uh, idiomatic dilemma when Davy told me that we'd be talking about urban revitalization, because this is a word I tend to have this trouble with. I hear it a lot, but I'm hesitant to use it, though I do. Um, and if I don't, I worry that I'm trying to take no position about things that deserve positions. As I reflected, I realized that my way out of this is to think about <coughs> revitalization as a complex term, um, one that's used popularly to mean a couple things, usually neighborhoods getting wealthier and often neighborhoods getting whiter. But revitalization doesn't have to mean those things. A more nuanced understanding begs the question, revitalization of what and revitalization for whom? If often used as a proxy for socioeconomic change, the vitality of revitalization could also refer to a revival of autonomy and control or decent affordable housing or jobs. To be a bit trite, revitalization is in the eye of the beholder. If the voices of dominant groups are the loudest, then their version of revitalization is most often heard, but it doesn't have to be that way. When I see my work through this lens, I can understand my interest in how marginalized groups use architecture and planning to gain autonomy as fundamentally a question of their own definitions of revitalization. By positioning those actors at the center of urban and architectural histories, we can see their actions not simply as reactions against dominant forces, um, but as positive visions of what their urban future can be. And we can understand revitalization then as a term that doesn't contain one meaning, but many. The answers to the questions of what and for whom depend on where one looks. We can get to a richer understanding of revitalization by understanding different kinds of spatial practices as revitalization too. I can only begin to show a couple ways I approach this, um, but hope that a brief glimpse into two projects, my book on Harlem and a new book I'm currently working on um, focused on an architect named J. Max Bond Jr can show some different understandings of urban revitalization that might help to shape both our own understanding and our conversation um, to follow. The first of these comes from my book, um, The Roots of Urban Renaissance. And broadly, as um, Davey let you kind of um, see into it, the book looks at a series of grassroots organizations in Harlem between the 60s and 2000s. Um, this is an era when Harlem became a symbol of gentrification as its boulevards started to fill up with large-scale chain retail. Um, its streets became home to new middle-class residents. Many observers attributed those developments to the role of outsiders to Harlem. Um, I argue that we can't understand the story without considering the role of the longtime residents of the neighborhood. The details of this are outside the scope of my remarks, but in general, I'm interested in the ways that different Harlemites reimagined and reshaped their community from the ground up. I examine activist architects and planners, ambitious community leaders, um, and regular folks who saw the built environment as a means toward realizing their ideal Harlem. Some of these efforts were dedicated to attracting wealthier residents um, and retail. Others offered the radical idea that a revitalized Harlem could be rebuilt by and for its existing and poorest residents. Um, in other words, that Harlem already contained the stuff <laughs> required to be a vital and successful neighborhood. One really vivid example of this is the subject of the book's fourth chapter, a movement of Harlemites who identified as low-income urban homesteaders or self-help housers and who sought to resurrect and rehabilitate abandoned housing units through their own labor. Housing abandonment had been a long-running problem in Harlem but reached a new scale in the 1970s. Uh, many buildings were old and had a lot of deferred maintenance. 
Um, the federal government was withdrawing its funding from cities. Oil prices skyrocketed at mid-decade. Um, and Harlemites were growing poor, and so they were less able to make rent. Absentee landlords who'd owned rental buildings purely as investments had little incentive to wait these factors out, so they squeezed out any rent they could, a process called milking, and then left them behind, and those buildings became city property after as little as one year of unpaid taxes. Landlords abandoned 40,000 housing units a year across New York City in the 1970s. The city owned an estimated 65% of Harlem's property by the early 1980s, about half of that as abandoned housing, the other as public housing. In this context, homesteading emerged as a method by which low-income residents could begin to turn an undeniable crisis into an opportunity and so enact their vision of revitalization. And specifically, they saw the means of affecting three goals through this process. Um, first was decent, affordable, and tenant-controlled housing in a community that had long been at the mercy of landlords. Um, second, homesteaders saw their sweat equity labors as a means to gain skills that could then be used for things like getting construction work. Uh, a field that still existed. Um, and third, low-income homesteading provided a path toward a more abstract goal, what we'll call control. Harlemites typically had little control over their homes and communities, but they saw self-help rehab as a means to gain influence over their lives and autonomy in making decisions that affected them. With these goals in mind, a variety of groups took on homesteading in and beyond Harlem. One particularly evocative example was this one, a street gang called the Renegades of Harlem, formed in 1973. Uh, members were young, Puerto Rican, and lived amid widespread abandonment in East Harlem. But they saw the hollowing out of their blocks as a chance to gain um, their homes from outsiders. As they explained to their neighbors, um, and here I quote, you can own your own home and finally be rid of the rats, the landlords, the leaks, and the city. We can rebuild our, home. We can rebuild our community ourselves. The renegades took up this cause in an abandoned tenement on East 119th Street. Other groups took up a building or two with similar goals in mind. Um, one of those was the Mosque of the Islamic Brotherhood, a Harlem mosque that gained permission from the city to rehabilitate uh, two adjacent tenements on West 113th Street for housing, um, retail, and a new worship space. Um, they saw in forsaken buildings a way to obtain both um, uh, worldly and spiritual shelter. Those groups literally revitalized buildings that were on the brink. They brought them back to life, the most basic definition of revitalize. They did so on a shoestring and pragmatically um, focused on making buildings fit for habitation at minimal cost. Um, as such, they completed as much construction as possible on their own, including um, boiler replacement, repainting, modest demolition, wall construction, roof replacement. Homesteaders also refinished and replaced fixtures, sometimes buying them on the cheap elsewhere and repurposing them, leading to things like buying bathtubs from Art Deco hotels in Midtown and bringing them to Harlem, um, uh, you know, other sort of fixtures that are misplaced or, or replaced in um, humble tenements. Though fundamentally about preservation, uh, their purpose was not the restoration of period detail, but with restoring needed homes before they deteriorated to the point of uselessness. A second intention was to train residents in the kinds of skills that could yield subsequent employment. Um, the Renegades, for example, uh, put 90 trainees um, into a program to learn construction skills in East Harlem and two other neighborhoods um, where they had associated groups. Above all, low-income home centers emphasized the objective of control rather than profit in pursuing self-help rehab. Um, in other words, low-income home centers effectively turned the logic of American real estate on its head Instead of seeing their goal as creating saleable commodities, they saw their goal as um, creating shelter. Um, and in so doing, they emphasized the use value of their homes over their exchange value. They pursued what one prominent self-building advocate at the time, a man named John F.C. Turner, called housing as a verb, um, the notion of housing as a process or activity, not housing as a noun, meaning as a commodity or a product. Turner argued that housing as a verb was a means toward personal fulfillment, a way of gaining me meaning through the process of self-reliant transformation, literally learning about yourself and your value as a human being by rebuilding your home, not thinking about selling that home. This was a lofty aspiration, but it was one that low-income homesteaders often seemed to realize. Um, at the mosque, 
Participants incorporated their furniture into the design of rehabilitated tenements. A modest gesture, but you know, think about it, literally putting what you have into your apartment and building an apartment around it. Um, not feeling like you need to put yourself into the space, but building a space around you. They expressed their cultural and religious identity in um, subtle ways like um, pointed arches around apartment doors, um, putting a mosque in their apartment building, you know, the tile work of the mosque. When an official questioned the renegade's um, slow pace of construction, a leader retorted, quote, don't you understand what we're trying to accomplish um, is something much greater than simply putting a building back together again. Advocates like to share a story of one neighborhood resident um, addicted to heroin who became curious about what the renegades were doing, joined their effort, learned plumbing, earned an income, and rebuilt a home. Those stories seem too good to be true, but they are common enough in more modest forms to suggest that residents were not just giving new life to buildings, but often to themselves. But they also materially contributed to their neighborhoods. Abandonment could be devastating. Fires were rampant on abandoned blocks. Illegal drug economies flourished in abandoned buildings. Homesteaders couldn't keep up with the scale of abandonment, but they made gains in stabilizing neighborhoods in which few outsiders in either the public or private sectors were otherwise doing anything. Um, they were sort of the last hope for themselves. The long-term implications of the story are more complicated than I can explain to you today, but can be summarized as mixed. Um, the Mosque of the Islamic Brotherhood succeeded in opening their building in 1979 with most tenants employed, many in construction. The renegades had a sadder fate um, they were successful in rehabbing their initial tenement, but then they too fell behind in taxes. This is an era of crazy inflation, which doesn't help anything. The city foreclosed on their building in 1985, but in 2002 sold it to the Youth Action Program, one of many rehab and job training programs that flourished in the Renegades' wake, which became the national nonprofit Youth Build USA. Um, both of those efforts created low-income housing that remains so to this day, um, joined by dozens of other Harlem buildings that came out of this movement. This is not the revitalization of high-end condos, market-rate apartments, or hip restaurants, all of which increasingly rise throughout Harlem, but it is a revitalization centered on the people who were most vulnerable in a neighborhood undergoing those changes. Harlem increasingly tends towards the former, not the latter, but this offers maybe a model of what a new vitality could look like um, if centered on shelter, stability, and control, and not profit. Low-income homesteaders' efforts were about buildings, but also uh, about the people doing that work. They were seeking to revitalize the revitalizer to help people who felt literally and figuratively abandoned by um, the kind of um, world that they occupied. This is also a case in the second example that I want to just briefly describe. The work of J. Max Bond Jr., or Max Bond, um, a major American architect in the post-war United States, uh, the most prominent African-American architect um, in that time, and a designer who uniquely focused his career on how he could shape a better, more inclusive, and more just world. Bond's career was long and diverse, um, running from his education in the 1950s to his death in 2009. He appears briefly in my Harlem book, and the fuller story of his career is the subject of a new book project. I won't focus on him in depth, but I want to just highlight his approach to urban revitalization. To questions of revitalization of what and for whom, Bond added the question, by whom? As a successful professional in a field with a minuscule population of African Americans, sort of for most of the last half century, there have been about 2% um, African American architects. This has not really changed um, in any substantial way. He used his unique position to try to ensure that the people shaping the built environment represented those who inhabited, inhabited it. Bond did this in a variety of realms, including um, as, a, as a professor and a dean, as, as a successful um, leader of his own firm. We can understand his work um, through two goals he maintained. One was civil rights equality, the other was economic justice. Both spoke to a desire to ensure broad engagement in the means and ends of revitalization. The first of these civil rights equality suggests the unique potential that Bond found in architecture as an activist tool. Bond was trained as an architectural modernist. He went to Harvard in the 1950s, which if you have any sort of um, life in architectural history, you might know is sort of the leading architecture school at the leading moment for people interested in modern architecture. And yes, he was the only black guy in his class, as you might have guessed. Um, his career began to take shape amidst the growth of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. 
he was the first cousin of Julian Bond, the very um, famed civil rights leader. His whole family was um, activists, educators. Um, Bond um, shaped uh, a design practice that merged kind of the modern and the activist. He didn't see them as separate, but as, as two sides of the same coin, or as two facets of the same uh, gem. What this looked like can be understood in an organization called the Architects Renewal Committee in Harlem, or ARCH. Bond came to lead ARCH in 1967 after, leave, after living in post-independence Ghana. Um, founded in 1964, ARCH initially set out to advocate on behalf of Harlemites threatened by urban planning projects. Um, experts with ARCH acted as intermediaries, providing design expertise to communities. But Bond reoriented the organization toward much more radical approaches to civil rights activism. Um, a subtle distinction, but an important one, insisting that architects shouldn't just be assisting as intermediaries, but should sort of be handing over control in planning to the people in Harlem who would be affected by plans. One way that, they, that he did this was by engaging the organization in direct action. Faced with redevelopment proposals for a Columbia University gym in Harlem's biggest par park, and a large state office building on Harlem's central block, Arch joined Harlemites in vocal confrontational activism and occupations of contested land. This is an image of a three-month occupation of the block at 125th Street and Lenox Avenue to try to stop the construction of what is now the state office building, if you know Harlem. Especially relevant to the topic of urban revitalization, Arch worked with residents to draft alternate plans in those cases, providing a community vision of what improvement would look like. Arch also launched a training program to bring young black and Puerto Rican residents who hadn't finished high school into the design professions. Um, this effort immersed students in architecture, taught them design in a studio setting, facilitated their placement in leading firms for internships, um, supported their applications to design schools. Um, those efforts brought new voices into professions that had often been actively hostile and continue to be actively hostile to people of color, uh, materially changing who did the work of urban revitalization. It's pretty profound. They put ads in bank branches and other places saying, you know, are you a high school dropout? Do you want to learn architecture? And then they taught those people architecture, and some of those people became architects. Um, so um, it's a, you know, simple but sort of fundamental. Um, after Bond left Arch in 1968 to form his own firm, he found new ways to keep activism at the center of his work, though more often doing so through architectural design than as, an act, uh, as a direct action activist. For Bond, this took form in a series of projects that framed key sites in civil rights history. Um, in Alabama, for example, his firm completed the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute in the early 1990s, a museum dedicated to the city's history and the movement, and a contemplative hinge between two tragic spaces um, to its north, as you can see in the map, the 16th Street Baptist Church, where um, white terrorists killed the four little girls in a 1963 bombing, and to its immediate east, um, Kelly Ingram Park, where the same year um, police attacked peaceful protesters, events whose images reached a national audience and sort of um, you know, famously helped to catalyze the civil rights movement um, on a national scale. Similarly, in Atlanta, Bond's firm designed the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change in the late 1970s, um, a research center, museum, and the site of Dr. King's tomb, which you can see in the foreground. The center's modern forms um, provided a connective thread between King's birthplace, his pastoral home, Ebenezer Baptist Church, and another King Museum nearby. Each of these projects used the big urban project, a kind of mainstay of urban revitalization, um, something that, you know, the University of Pennsylvania certainly does too, right? Put a big project in a neighborhood and try to revitalize the neighborhood. But they did so to try to draw visitors to impoverished neighborhoods through the lens of civil rights. And, and so to concretize civil rights history in the landscape of public memory, to sort of reify it in architecture. The material and labor histories of these and other built projects speak to the second way that Bond shaped this inclusive approach to revitalization. Um, through efforts to foster economic justice. Architects choose the materials that constitute their projects for a range of reasons, um, cost, appearance, strength, ease of use. While those aspects certainly concern Bond as well, a different quality also motivated the choices he made, what a material involved in terms of construction labor. And by that, I mean that for Bond, deciding a building's material meant also deciding who would build that building and how that building would be built. 
This is another Bond project, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. You might notice what is in common with these projects. Um, concerned with racial equality and persistently discriminatory construction professions, Bond prioritized materials that could increase opportunities for African American workers. And the persistence of brick across Bond's project is traced to this motivation. As he explained in 1981, and here I quote, if one were to design a building completely out of aluminum products, very few minority people in America could work on that building because the aluminum industry is one in which not many minorities are involved. If one were to design a building in brick or block, there would be a much greater chance of employing more minority people. Um, as you may or may not know, construction unions are notoriously extremely racist. Um, we are somewhat experiencing the legacy of that at our national politics to this day. Um, brick unions uh, were more integrated. More than this, Bond considered what designs would yield more labor-intensive construction processes, and he split designs into smaller pieces to enable smaller firms to bid on them with the thinking that a firm led by a principal um, who was not a white person may often have a less competitive advantage if they're competing against big firms um, because they would be smaller, typically. Each of these strategies was meant to ensure that more people of color would gain economic benefit from the projects that he was really just engaged in as the designer. So he's using the leverage of an architect. These efforts may seem modest, but they suggest an imaginative approach to economic justice in the communities where he designed. Um, places like Harlem, Atlanta's um, Sweet Auburn neighborhood, downtown Birmingham, or small town Mississippi, all majority minority places, all racked by high unemployment and discrimination. Dominant approaches to revitalization in those places often involved economic or racial change, but Bond suggested a way to build on and bring in the talented but overlooked people who were already there. A building can't solve the structural problems of capitalism, but in a profession where most architects were not thinking about racial representation and labor at all, Bond offered a radically different conception of the potential work that revitalization could do. And here I conclude. Uh, let this be a call for the use of revitalization as a framework for thinking about urban transformation. Let this be my endorsement of this term. We need some name for intentional urban change. If it brings a city closer to someone's goal of a more vital, more lively place, then let us describe it as urban revitalization. But let me also insist that we ask who that someone is, revitalization for whom. Historical actors like the Renegades, members of the Mosque of the Islamic Brotherhood, or Max Bond insisted on answers to that question that were inclusive, ambitious, and radical uh, in both means and ends, and we should too. Thank you. Thank you. Gosh, thank you very much, Brian. That was great. And also, thank you, Davey, um, for that beautiful framing introduction. Um, so I'm going to, I'm gonna integrate a little bit of what Brian was talking about into my presentation, um, particularly uh, these three concepts of shelter, stability, and control. Um, what I hope to do during my time, and I'm going to set up a timer so I don't just ramble. <laughs> um, what I'm hoping to do during my time is to talk through a few different ah, clock somewhere. To talk to a few through a few different, um, I guess we could say modalities of this question, um, moving from the space of the city um, to questions of uh, upward mobility to questions of the role of the black artist and black professor as decoder and access point, um, and also Wakanda. I wanna talk a little bit about Wakanda um, as a way of sort of uh, kind of an opening joke of sorts. Um, if you could have dual citizenship and one of the places that you had to have citizenship was was the US, right? And you had to have dual citizenship with the US and one uh, fictional um, Afro-diasporic city or country. Um, would you choose Wakanda, Zamunda, or Stankonia? Uh, 
think about that. Right on to you. <laughs> Fugitivity. You want no part of what you were apart from, but are now a part of, but were always apart for, thus apart from what you were for. If this is you, is you this, staying put? And are you in pieces where that is? You stay staying put to be a part of it, and it is a part of the big it, but apart from the part you play in it, and the piece of a part you play in it, is it a place to stay put in? And if you put you in, who's a party to you staying put in? Back then, they were put in to stay being put upon by the other they, to stay staying a part of the other they's place to stay put. They were pieces, parts, put upon to put out for the soon-to-be big it. And if they wanted no part of it, or if they wanted to take a part of it, they were wanted and pieced apart into parts and pieces to be pieced back into the it they departed. Now, if we play the they then, is that a put on? Not that we aren't put upon. But the part they played, is that our now? What stay a part of wanting to be apart from it, wanting no part of it, or it, or a part of an alternate it, where you wouldn't stay just parts and pieces, but put together together, not an it in the it, but the it or the alternate it, to be a part one runs from. Then, the they ran for freedomification. Now, you run from it less for freedomifying than for spite, and F you. The spite is from despising it, and despise is from looking at. The fugitive, a critic, it decides to run from what it aspires to despise. When you despise it and it, despite what you might want from being a party to it and it, you must run, or if you stay staying put, you must stay putting up with being the they and the other they. You stay playing yourself for what you want, even though you think you're playing some of them, which you can do. You can do it. Just stay put. Fugitivity is to not want what some they are wont to want. The fugitive runs from that want into the unwanted and will maybe be despised as wanting by the big it and many little its. The fu displays the parts of the it the theys are a party to, a part of and apart from. Such display makes staying playing your part wanting, maybe when, and who wants to feel like the it or it shit? The fugitive's critical run from tells the them that, and some despise that running, some the looking, some the it or it, but most stay staying put, putting out and putting in, hoping not to be put upon or put out. But when more some come to want what the fugitive's wants have freed, this sum of new sums gonna run. And as more run, the span from the big it to the alternative it seems less apart. The unwanted fugitive becomes wanted, and once wanted, the big it espies and may play that it espouses. Look, look, even bigger big houses thus run. The role of black artists, Afro-diasporic artists, um, and Afro-diasporic scholars is to oftentimes provide a point of entry into Afro diasporic cultural ideas, um, texts, um, thinking. Now, what is complex about that is how many of these ideas, aesthetics, and thinking were designed particularly and specifically and explicitly to not be legible, to not be decoded, to in fact be encrypted. I began thinking about this when I was a grad student at CalArts. Um, as a writer, I was thinking about it in terms of language and culture. Um, what is the sort of cultural capital that comes in something, say, black vernacular? What happens when language that is called slang or broken English becomes um, available as a kind of cultural capital um, for people who have not been at the and this is an unfortunate term, but I think it works, ground zero of the development of that language. In other words, what happens the first time you hear slang in a McDonald's commercial? What happens when uh, Burger King, I think it was, uh, in an advertising campaign tweets and says something like, but those chicken strips though. What happens when the space of the language the conceptual house of that language um, 
no longer is available to the people who originally built it, um, and it becomes available and habitable uh, by people who would drive them out of it. Um, this, I, 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 this makes me think a great deal about, <laughs> and about how Brian is critically and importing, importantly tapping into this question of revitalization, that in that coded language, we have to ask the very question of who is this for and what does it mean? What needs to be brought back to life in that moment? Um, my own work is oftentimes engaged in this question of signifying, engaged in these questions of legibility, to the point where I would say that some of the things that I have been interested in over the course of my work is how to create work that does things like that. That's writing. Now, it's not a picture any more so than any letter form is a picture. That's, that's writing. But we come to a, a position where we're asking the question, do I read that? Or do I look at it, right? And the reading suggests a different sort of relationship to legibility. Now, depending upon where you're from, depending upon what crew you're with, depending upon what your um, particular aesthetic codes are, you might find that extraordinarily legible. It is someone's name. And so you would look at that as a text, right? That one is Alcept. If we begin to think about this kind of legibility as a point of access, and I want to talk about access and legibility almost interchangeably in this moment of sort of linguistic uh, uh, animation, um, I want to think about the shelter of language. What does, what does language present? What is its apparent external structure? We come, we see a house, we see a building. We see a tent. And what does that do in relationship to its interior? There might be windows, OK, but do the windows have blinds? All right, so I can't see all the way in. There might be a screen door, OK, but then there's a door behind that. I can't see all the way in. I get a basic sense of the dimensions, perhaps if I assume that everything is above ground. But our sense of that shelter is going to be twinned, because one person's shelter might be another person's space of a sale. One person's shelter might be another person's prison, depending upon the dynamics in that. In thinking about this related to language while I was in grad school, I began to think about how I could investigate and trouble this question of access um, and trouble this question of linguistic shelter, stability, and control. And I began to develop an opera. And the opera was at that point called Jungai, but it is now called Ben Bannock, um, modeled after Ben Banneker, Benjamin Banneker, um, urbanist, designer of Washington, DC. Um, and what this opera did was it was based on a place called Jungai that was built by an urbanist, an imagined sort of, I guess we could say Wakandan Zamundan, you know, <laughs> you know um, an African-American nostalgic version of some random African place, some originary place. This is what it was when I was in grad school. And essentially, this city was under great control by the builder of the city, who was also named Jungai. There was one member of the city, however, who was unhappy with being there. And his name was Poda, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, the entire opera was written in a counterfeit language. And I'll read some of that in, to you in a moment. This counterfeit language was made up of Afro-diasporic language borrowed for about maybe 200 years of history, um, everything from Pig Latin and Mendy to Kriptov. When this character, Poda, was trying to escape the city, which involved breaking through a wall, he revealed translations of the language, supertitles. When Poda was incapacitated, the language went untranslated. 
access control was regulated by POTA's attempt to escape, POTA's attempt to have a transformative relationship to the space. It is not always the case that a desire to escape, that a desire to make available a conversation between an external and an internal leads to a corrosive predatory relationship. And it certainly doesn't have to be that way. But I was interested in those moments when it does. I was interested in the moments when music that is developed in a juke becomes available to larger audiences and who is able to capitalize on that. If there's going to be a participation in capitalism at that level, who gets to capitalize from it? And that to me was something very interesting. A bit of Bimbanic. Once I published this, I of course had to figure out some kind of way to replicate um, the obfuscation of the text, of the translation, and also the moments where you were allowed to see parts of it. And I used these boxes of stage directions as a way of creating obstacles towards reading it. So I'm going to read uh, Dami Astropirish, um, which translates to a breathtaking house. And this is sung by Bimbanik, who at this point had evolved into a two-headed figure, not unlike Mawu Lisa. Repede dis dame astor pirish, fissi melebuku. Rep dame astor pirish, fissi melebuku. Yeah. Dun aluna iktun mi ha. Igup de me na what ad ala nun lewi. A deish io gre me a dea. E se me what ad ala nun lewi. A deish io gre me a dea. Igup de me, seem aluna ik pe me. On some smooth rag eke eke nanze. Nanzi, sim elebuko iogremi. Aluna bizuna ye elona bizuna. Na biz de nacro a dea. House a day dis dami nacro. Feel ke ig de de danzish kayul, kayul. De benunk mi elebuku, de kizi mi elebuku ye. House a day mi das, oh, sorry, house a day dis dami astor pirish. Where are the points of entry? Where do I get to demonstrate a certain level of authorial control? In live performance, the stability of my control would shift, and we might see more of the text than before. My attitude toward this has always been that if somebody wanted to do the work, the sweat equity, of going through this and figuring out that for me, Belbedev, um, based upon Bel Biv DeVoe, was the uh, ngumbo term for poison, and wanted to figure out um, all the language to do that translation, I was fine with that. But to me, it was about the access and what somebody had to do to get that access. Two more things, and then I think I'm uh, used about all my time. We're going to get to Wakanda in just a second. presence of Afro-diasporic subjects in the US has oftentimes been, I would argue, through audio, first and foremost. Um, race music, right? Which was interesting that you know people tried to patrol the kind of borders of radio stations, but as we know, broadcast like smoke in a restaurant just drifts wherever it's going to drift as long as it's within range. You can't really control it. But this is one of the ways that um, people who hadn't necessarily encountered African Americans, um, although many people had <laughs> um, um, encountered them through music, through um, these kinds of vectors of entertainment. So I began to think about the presence of black folks in the United States in particular as a kind of sound. In The Black Automaton, I talked about that as radio. The first black person you met was a radio. Um, that continues in Buck studies to a certain extent with these poems called That Loud Ass Colored Silence. I'm gonna pull these up just so you can see some of them. And the one I'm gonna pull up in particular, I'll make sure I 
So this is that loud ass colored silence beat music. Um, for those of y'all who aren't familiar with beat music, it's a, it's, it's a music that uses some of the sort of sonic palette of hip hop um, um, and, and, and other electronic uh, drum bass music um, to create these sort of sound beds. One of the most famous practitioners would be like Flying Lotus, it's very popular in Los Angeles. We can trace it also to other instrumental hip hop um, traditions, things like, uh, you know, Jay Dilla's Donuts or things like um, DJ Shadow's End Traducing. Um, and one day when I was feeling perverse and um, phlegmatic, I began to think about the possibility of imagining beat music as being a kind of sonic gentrification. What happens when you get all of the kind of vibe of hip hop without the pesky Negro voices talking at you <laughs> and saying bad words? Boom! A uh, yes, yes. What's left get done to death? Those colored thumps are such a cheaper lot and breezy commute. Clack, boom, clack, boom, boom. Clack, boom, clack, boom. X marks the location, location, location. Boom, clack, boom, boom. Clack, boom, I have beaded a silence back into you. Pushing the low ends instrumental to the boom, the flown rewound to a new track. Bust the beaten out, some exit the old style, enter the jack. Oh, yes, yes. In the place to be. Yes, yes, yes. See how close we are to the museums? Boom, clap, boom, boom, clap, boom. Beat it. You bother me. The beat ain't spit, but a pattern of loud ass colored silences. Pack not, who could trap in this track? No ain't to taint, no yo to oi, no tearing tongue to spoil your parade on home. Just a clipping of funk in 32 bit ambience you can live with. Boom, clap, boom, 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 clap, boom, boom, clap, boom, clap, boom, boom, clap, boom, boom, clap, boom, boom, clap, boom, 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 boom. See how close we are to the museums? Now this is complicated by the fact that we have to take a really close look at history, right? Um, if we're talking about the presence of black voices in hip hop, it would be overly simplistic in the spirit of what I think, of what I've, I've, I'm appreciating about Brian's work, to assume that some of the most vocal opponents to hip hop were angry conservative white people, when the truth of the matter is middle class and middle aged black people were oftentimes more critical of hip hop entering the stations. The people who listen to R&B, Anita Baker, oftentimes have mad beef with hip hop, jazz, blues, mad beef with hip hop. It is complex and nuanced, which takes us, of course, to Wakanda. <laughs> when I watch Black Panther, what becomes interesting to me and, and my family, you know, we talked about this and I've talked about it with friends. The thing that strikes me most about Wakanda in Black Panther is that first and foremost, it is not an adequate metaphor, um, especially in the narrative of the film, uh, for an originary space for the Afro diaspora. The reason why it is an inadequate metaphor for that is that Wakanda was quite explicit in noting that none of its people had been sold. So it becomes complex in that way. So how is Wakanda productive and use, useful for us in this moment? And I began to think, Wakanda is a gated community. The big question in Wakanda is, who is our sort? Who passes the paper bag test to get into Wakanda? As we all probably know, if you're not familiar with the paper bag test, the paper bag test was instituted largely by black social organizations to see if you were too dark to enter that social organization because in an effort to be upwardly mobile and to participate in a version of, say, American capital that would have thought of revitalization as something different than, say, shelter, stability, and control, there was a sense of who would be allowed into these sorts of spaces and who wouldn't. Wakanda, to me, in the Black Panther film, and I love talking about it as if it's a documentary, um, <laughs> um, is useful because it begins to ask, it helps us to ask certain questions, I think, about the formation of class, the formation of access to materials, education, technology, and wealth. I mean, that's Injadaka's big issue with Wakanda, that they had the good shit and wouldn't share it, that they could have provided space, shelter, stability, and control and you know Black Panther's problem 
And our problem as the audience is the nature of what that control would mean. Right? That's the problem with Indy Dick. That the control he wants to have looks too much like white supremacist control. Right? But the control that's already present is just fine. So thinking about these points of access, who gets in, how language abets this, oh my gosh, it, the, 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 the trees on revitalization, thank you, um, has been something that I've been interested in in a long time. And I'll just end with this image because that's, that's gonna be my time. And I think I actually did okay. <laughs> my newest work, because I know that's something we're supposed to think about, <laughs> Um, let me do it like this. Is moving towards this kind of thing. This uh, samples a little Basquiat and some other stuff. Uh, this this one is a critique of Steve Reich's Come Out to Show Me. In some ways, we can think about these as maps, plans, um, spaces to be traversed. Um, when we talk about the emotional resonance of the city, um, I think not only of psychogeography, but I also think about parkour. How do we make it through a city, and at what level do those same strategies help us make our way through language? Hi, this is a question for Douglas, because um, there was a lot there right at the end. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could, what did you say was a critique of Steve Reich? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, come, yeah, come out Could you say a little more about that? And also, um, could you say more about this idea of a parkour and language, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. how that works? OK, um, so I'll, I'll try to be speedy. The Steve Reich kind of goes back to the idea of encountering black folks as sort of sound. Um, the, uh, the piece come out is about um, some victims of police brutality who are forced to confess to a crime they did not commit, um, is the idea, right? Um, and Steve Reich found a recording of, of them talking about the, uh, the bruised blood they, that they pressed on the bruised blood so that it would come out, so the blood would come out to show them. And Steve Reich was interested in how, in just speech, you would have rising and falls in pitch, and so it becomes musical. So come out to show them, so that the bruised blood would come out to show them. And then he loops, come out to show them, 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 come out to show them. Um, what's interesting to me about that is it's, Per, it's exactly at an intersection of uh, a black encounter with a system with a system of power, you know, a police officer, um, and that that becomes a kind of a sound bed and a sound palette that continues over the course of it's about twelve or thirteen, maybe even fourteen minutes, um, to the point where it be and and also there's processing going on, feedback loops and sort of things. So it becomes become this kind of echoing, ah, nah, 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 you know, like this kind of thing. So it becomes illegible. Um, so first, it's 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 material about an actual incident of suffering and domination that becomes a musical material that then becomes a kind of a sound bed um, for an experiment around pitch. Now, it's I'm not. I'm not making the argument that Steve Reich was callous and like, I'm just gonna do this you know, like that. But I think that at some level it began to imitate certain kinds of patterns 
um, in the kind of reduction of black suffering to uh, a sound. Um, and here we had something that was speech that gets turned into music and then sound and then ultimately noise. Um, and so that to me was something that was really interesting about that and, and sort of frustrating about it. Um, I was at Bard this summer and Malik uh, Gaines was playing that piece as a part of um, um, some of his presentations. And I that night I went home and made this piece um, as a kind of a reaction to it. So it's 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 a it's a hot take. <laughs> it is a hot take. Um, and uh, the other question was say it one more time. Parkour. 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 Okay. So parkour. The idea about parkour um, is not predicated on jumping on shit. The idea of parkour is that you do not follow. It's about going in a straight line. It's about not going through the zones and districting that the city planners have designed for you to go to. Um, if you want to go, if you want to get from here to here, and there's a shopping district here, or you know, like, like industrial, whatever, the idea with parkour is that you don't go down those streets and enter that space, that you just go, well, I just have to go in a straight line, and if that means I have to climb some stuff, or jump on some stuff, or jump down some stuff, then I'll do it, right? That's like sort of the originary idea. Um, I've been thinking about this in terms of a relationship to syntax and in terms to a relationship to um, content and trying to imagine if in this metaphor, which is still kind of a rough, loose metaphor for me now, um, what are the zones, what are the buildings, what are the, you know, you know. So does this do parkour because I am not writing about or creating an expositional um, paragraph or stanza, and instead I am presenting image and sound in such a way that it takes on a character of being already present, is the is a sentence that doubles back on itself, executing parkour in a kind of way of creating a sort of density of, mu of movement that you might see in a tic-tac, which is when people, one of the kind of famous moves in parkour, is when somebody jumps up to a wall, bounces off one wall, bounces off the next wall, bounces off the next wall, bounces off the next wall, gets off. Right? Is that chiasmus, <laughs> right? Is that, or is that some other sort of ex inherited uh, rhetorical scheme? So in thinking about how language, and not and 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 not in a, um, and I, and I'll sh shut up, and not in a, not in a, uh, a parochial sort of way, but what happens when language is getting in the way of what you want to say? So how do you create a syntax that lets you say what you want to say um, without certain parts of speech or certain syntactic conventions getting in the way? Um, and what's the relationship between that and concentration and compression and yet flyness? Because like if all parkour people did was like climb up and then walk over, we just, okay, this, that guy's just climbing some shit. That Chassis, is, she's just climbing some shit. But they're doing this other stuff. So it's not about being bereft, but it's about a dynamic of directionality. Oh. How do we do the mic? Mike, gotta get up there. Okay, All right, it's coming to you. <laughs> exactly. I'm just sitting here going like this is gonna. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. First of all, both of you like that fascinating. Topics. I really love and want to think a lot deeper on the idea of like the metaphor of of culture itself being a home that can be repossessed and in a way of linking that to thinking about gentrification. Um, but the last of, of those needs that you talked about was control. And and a lot of times in those circular conversations that you get into about kind of like who owns a certain culture, or who owns a certain neighborhood. It all goes back to, okay, so you know, I mean, you're, we're, we're still talking about ownership, you know? Right. We're talking about what you can buy when it comes down to space. And that's not the kind of world we're trying to live in anyway. And so what, what right do you have to control when it feeds into the same kind of capitalist system that you're supposed to be against in the first place? So um, I guess in the history uh, in, in Harlem that, that you've come upon, and, and just in, in kind of like thinking about culture, is, is, that, is, is that just an impossible like logic puzzle at that point? I mean, it's a, 
it is a um, it's a dream that it certainly is very present in Harlem in the in the stuff that I'm looking at, um, but does tend to sort of um, you know eclip- there's an eclipse of it often, and one of the examples is the one I showed you with the urban homesteaders. You know, there's a the idea of um, not being interested in uh, housing as commodity was not just rhetorical. It was I mean they tried to live that reality. There's yeah. um, you know stuff that seems very boring for this audience, but things like limited equity cooperative housing where you, you don't, you, know, <laughs> you, don't, you don't get to um, sell your home for a profit. You can sell it for like a kind of pre-determined um, rate of appreciation. Um, but the idea being that the housing is not used for speculation, but it's used for shelter. I always think that's kind of interesting though, because that means that you know the person who is in the mosque who decides to rehab his apartment can't sell it for profit, but, you know, um, anyone else who enters into the private market could, you know, make all the money they wanted off of it. So there is, in a capitalist world, there is obviously still an inequality there. But that kind of points to the problem, which is that, you know, you can't build a non-capitalist utopia in a capitalist structure, and Harlem is, you know, that's why Harlem is so um, in high demand now, because it's, you know, 10 minutes from Midtown, um, you know, it's on the park, um, it's got beautiful buildings that are affordable for New York City. So, you know, the same, the, um, you know, the, the rally I showed you on the state office building site was part of this kind of, um, it's okay, don't worry. Um, it, I like your images. <laughs> it, was, it was part of an effort to basically build a kind of communitarian utopia on that block for three months. People, you know, had drum circles and they cooked for one another and um, they had people like... Um, uh, Amiri Baraka and um, names escape me. Jazz pianist Graves, Clifford Graves, no, Milford. Milford Graves came to thank you. Came to the site and played for people. And there was this kind of trying to create a, a sort of collective culture where people built each other's houses and they lived. But of course, you know, when Nelson Rockefeller, the governor, wanted to bulldoze them out, he did it. So um, yeah, it's really hard. I mean, in a in a world in which real estate is so dominant. I'm not sure how you get out of that, um, except you know through these temporary, very vivid and you know wonderful moments. Some of my favorite moments that I've found in my research, but you know three months, um, six years, um, fifty years, but only your apartment. You know, it's it's always um, on a very limited terrain. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think uh, I think it's Sylvia Winters um, writing, uh, who, who writes a lot about the kind of construction of. The, the notion of the human um, as something that people would want to aspire to be, and whether or not that is still is that is that is that what we should be calling ourselves anyway? In other words, if the idea of human is loaded, it's not just like it didn't just nominate itself to us one day and kind of go like. <gasps> that's what we are, it actually comes with a set of characteristics and a set of um, things that you are not if you're a human, right? Um, that control of that language in that moment means that if you are attempting to participate, um, as you're saying, Brian, like, like, like you can try to disengage from capitalism and create a non-capitalist utopia, but that's a different project than saying, I want to participate in capitalism. I just want to. I just want my share. I want my piece. Um, that 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 the, that the that the former ultimately will fail, right? Um, uh, without larger systemic change, then we go to the other question, which is where my anxiety, you know, was being performed in these pieces. That in the desire to do that, is it ever really a fair exchange? Mm. Do you ever actually have? the same access or what do you give away in creating this exchange? If it's not a one-way exchange, that doesn't mean that it's balanced. It just means that there's at least more two flows. Um, so I, I, so I, bring up, I bring up Sylvia Winter in this moment to, because I want to think a little bit I mean, I, and when I say I want, I'm saying literally I've been thinking a little bit about what does it mean to re-characterize what desire is, what movement is, what stability 
is. Um, in our current cultural moment, um, context, and I don't mean this in an alarmist sort of way, I mean like context is radically different than even it was 30 or 40 years ago, which is to say, if we were streaming this, anybody in the world could be watching this. So our access to it, we might have access to being able to ask questions in a different way, but if we were streaming it and had a live feed of Twitter questions, that would be a different kind of access too. So how do these shifts in context, how this shift in the ability to talk to anyone who has access to the internet, because we can't, we can't imagine that everyone in the world does, but the ability to have, to have a conversation with, any, with anyone who has access for considerably less money than it used to cost to do that kind of thing. How does that change our perception of place? And I feel like that is something that um, cultures that have had to deal with movement and fugitivity um, for you know centuries might actually be able to contribute to in in a different kind of arena of conversation. What what how do we define and what are we pre preparing for? So if we're thinking about stability um, as stability related to the 1950s, is that the state is that the actual stability we can achieve or should achieve or what and so for me what's interesting about the human what's interesting about the desire what's interesting about how the renegades um and and uh and 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 because it, it was it was it the renegades who was it that was talking about housing as a was that bond um it was a, another guy uh, sort of housing theorist named john turner john turner so the moment of looking at the term housing and saying it should be a verb not a noun Right? That's a moment of examination that allows us to think deeper about what it is that we're actually saying we want at any given time. And then, of course, that we, I keep throwing out there, is amorphous as well and has oftentimes been used to silence as much as it has been used to amplify some people. So at the linguistic level, um, as, as Brian demonstrated like really generously in talking about working with the terms transformation and revitalization and revitalizing revitalization as a term. Um, I think that that's important. It's not the end of it. This doesn't become like an argument about what we call things, but it is an important part of how we're actually projecting what it is uh, that the people involved in the conversation are saying they want. I also think, I mean, there are non-economic realms in which some of those ideas can take place or should take place. Um, the the sonic, obviously, being one where, as you say, there, there's a kind of, you know, a gated community can be created, uh, perhaps for good, not ill. Mm -hmm. Although I was thinking as you were talking about, um, Michael Arsenault wrote an essay, I think in Gawker, before Gawker went away, mm -hmm. um, about, like, the way that the sound of Harlem was changing and mm -hmm. how, you know, his sort of, expectation of hearing certain genres of music, R&B, hip hop in particular, mm -hmm. was starting to be undermined by this kind of sonic gentrification that was right. happening there. Right. Um, and also there's been a recent sort of um, debacle in Marcus Garvey Park in Harlem where um, there's been a drum circle there like nonstop mm -hmm. for, I don't know, about 50 years. And um, some new buildings that were built on the square, you know, sort of condos, um, they, you know, s started to sort of call the police and say basically like you know can you make the drum circle s shut up <laughs> which you know the drum circle is not just a drum circle it's a it's a spatial configuration that comes out of a specific tradition of of black nationalism and is representing like the presence of that group of people you know nonstop for decades and so you know in a way it's a non-capitalist world of heart which obviously mm -hmm. doesn't know you know there's no there's no financial aspect to it but right. so displacing that is almost um, you know more violent than displacing you know the tenant upstairs or something yeah. because it's actually changing the noise of the place absolutely i mean is, noise ordinances noise blight all of mm -hmm. these kinds of coded ways of talking yeah, of about course. what you want in and out of what someone wants in and out of their community uh, cultures a lot of things yeah absolutely I just had a really general question about inserting the concept of irony or play into this discourse and what happens because um, when we talk about ownership, um, we tend to think in terms of 
sort of communities, aggregations, sides. But one of the wonderful things about irony is that it breaks apart that dynamic and allows people to think in terms of their personal relationship. It doesn't coalesce a community. It actually has the positive effect, it seems to me, of allowing space to reconceive of one's relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm thinking about this particularly with regard to, to the recitation of Come Out, because I'm thinking, of course, of the blood come out, but then it becomes very complicated in that repetition. It's queer coding, right, reemerges, all sorts of other possibilities reemerge. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if there's a generative possibility in irony in terms of built environments and what that would look like. Can I, do you mind if I borrow the cord real quick? No, please. You might be able to help me puzzle out something that has always been very interesting to me um, and not something, I, I'm, I am not um, sure kind of what, I've never been quite sure what to make of it, um, which you may not have noticed, but the yeah. Renegades of Harlem uh, misspelled their organization's name. Yeah, um, <laughs> and there were even like, you know, commentaries at the time, like it's R-E-N-I, um, you know, like they were correcting people. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's, I like, have Googled and you know I've just never really figured out and I don't know if you would call that irony but you know it's something yeah. that to me always sort of seemed like um, a decision that was more than um, accidental you know and then became a kind of thing or maybe it is maybe it was accidental but became a thing well, so R-E-N-I right? -E or no yeah, R-E-N-I-G oh, no, -E -I -I yeah yeah, yeah. So the type, you know, and I've even had like editors correct my typo and stuff. I'm like, no. So, I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly how to answer your question, except that there's a certain playfulness um, to a lot of the groups that interest me that shows, you know, that they're often less serious than the people that are trying to dominate them, and I think often are resilient in a way because of that. Um, you know, that they don't sort of take things quite as seriously as everybody else seems to. Um, I mean, you know, we're in a very, sorry to keep referring to our, like, present crisis, I guess that's all I can think of, but, um, <laughs> you know, we're in an era when, like, um, you know, we're in a very humor, I mean, that's, like, the real violence, I think, among many others of this moment is, like, how humorless our, our sort of present society has become. I mean, all I could mm -hmm. think when you talked to us on Twitter is, as like, you know, the mob will find us somewhere right. and destroy right. us for something right. we say, right? right. Um, so, you know, nothing's funny anymore. Um, so, you know, being in the 70s in New York when the city's literally on the brink of disaster and being able to sort of even see, like, the tiniest bit of irony or humor, um, a different literary device but related, you know, seems like a coping mechanism that's important, mm -hmm. right? And it's not, um, I'm not clear what it means. But, but, but irony also, also creates exclusion. Because there's somebody who doesn't know you're being ironic. I mean, mm -hmm. we're talking about satire. Or doesn't get it. Or doesn't get it, right? We were talking about satire yesterday. And, and when I think about that in relationship to signifying, a part of the irony in signifying is designed to obscure what you actually really feel to anybody who doesn't get it. Um, so, so, and also, being less serious doesn't, of course, and, and you know, doesn't necessarily mean being less urgent. Um, and so on the question of generative, what's generative in that production, ge I mean, generativity, um, you know, we tend to think about that as being very, very positive. But again, for whom? Um, you know, the, the prison industrial complex is generative. <laughs> I mean, it, it makes, and it makes something that a lot of us think is good. It makes money. So for whom? Is that ironizing in that space generative? And it's not necessarily that Steve Reich entered that saying, I am going to amplify this moment to, to draw it out. So that's why I have trouble like articulating it as a failure. I can talk about it as something that bugs the shit out of me, but that's me. But to me, why it bugs me is that it's much less avant-garde than it's drawn out to be. It's a recording of black people talking about pain that's turned into an interesting sonic diversion, which is kind of the history of black music and therefore popular music in the United States. So to me, it's not, it's, 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 it doesn't rupture what I think people who talk about it in certain ways think it ruptures. And so that to me is what was 
what was what was the peak of it. But I but but totally as a way of sort of rethinking recording technology, studio, highlighting these parts of the voice, the idea of what happens when when signal, right, turns to noise. I think that those are all very rich. In my head, sometimes I wish it were somebody just reading from the phone book. Mm -hmm. Because my question is, why did it need to be that resource if we're just talking about pitch and that sort of modulation? So, so again, but, but, but as I said, I heard it that day and was like, fuck, nah. So, you know. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. I, I totally get that, but yeah. I have to ask because you use the term buck in the title of your book, yeah. right? Which yeah. is an ironic appropriation of a racist trope. Right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And we're expected to read its irony off the page. Um, so, But I don't know if it's yeah. all the way ironic. I'm not using it strictly no, ironically. No, 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 of course. That, but, 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 but that's the difference. Yeah. I can't, I don't use that term as only ironic. I think what's useful for me, um, there's this quote from Andre 3000 in Humble Mumble. And I found this extraordinarily useful. Um, and it kind of slant rhymes with something that Charles and I kept sort of talking about last night. Um, and the line goes, I met a critic, I made her shitter draws. She said she thought hip hop was only drugs and alcohol. I said, oh, hell no, nah. but yet it's that too. <laughs> if it's only ironic, it's not but that too. When I use buck studies, I am not being ironic. I am being accurate in a gaze that looks at certain members of our community as being bucks who are available to be buckshot and bucked down. That's not ironic to me. Now, it has multiple layers, but I would argue that that's not just surrendering it to irony. And I would argue that that, that is key to me. Um, and again, I am totally available, totally available to the critique and the criticism of asking who gains from it. And that is a really important question that I ask for. It's why I try not to range playfully around any number of groups that I might feel intersectional relationships with. Because if I play around with some shit that doesn't, that I'm not gonna be the person for whom the check comes due, that's problematic to me. Now that is my ethos, and I can't impose that ethos on other people. But I do think there are a lot of people who don't have that as a functioning ethos. And I do think that that's something that we can talk about. Pass the mic. Last question. Pass the mic. Eat food. Um, I, hello. Um, I, have, I have some trouble with like the structures of these kinds of things. So I have a, a basic question, which would be, do you guys, is the point of this that you have a shared mission, or do you have something in common? Is that the point of like pairing you <laughs> together? And if you did have something in common, I would wonder what that was, because I haven't got it so far. Huh. We failed you then. Um, well, I think we are both interested in um, different worlds created around um, sort of spaces of identity and access and control, for one thing, as, as Doug said well. Um, in different ways, interested in, in questions of what the urban is and how it's constituted and reconstituted um, with different ends in mind and also interested very much in how language constructs assumptions that aren't unpacked, and that that very unpacking is, at some level, the first thing that we should do before we venture into any of that. Mm -hmm. I think that those things draw us together in this conversation. Thank you, Deidre. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just add that uh, one of the main characters in my book, Calvin Butts, a reverend in Harlem, was uh, very eager to whitewash literally any um, billboard or anything else related to um, rap music as it emerged in the 80s, even as he was also <laughs> involved in building um, some of the important kind of affordable housing and middle class condominiums for um, new black uh, gentrifiers. So these uh, people in some of the stories that you told and I told are um, identical people.
Mm -hmm. Thank you both so much. Thanks a lot.